I have never been to India before, and um, when we were trying to set up the mission, I was looking to see where, where can we go that where where we have some sort of contact information to start with, because it is difficult. You come to a new place, new hospital, new country, you need maybe some sort of point of con contact. So. We were lucky to have had uh, international fellows here at UCSD and one of our former fellows, Dr. Srivatsa, is at UC Davis now. She spent a year at this hospital in India and she told me, this Ricky, this would really work. This will be a good place for us. Um, so that's how we ended up choosing India in this particular hospital. And, and, um, and um, this was definitely a first. We wanted to, to make it a, a UCSD team, but with slightly different areas of expertise, um, because I felt like if we're going to go and we're going to go to a new hospital, we want to bring as much uh, of expertise to the table as possible. So um, we put together myself, who um, do a lot of pacemakers and defibrillators, so that would be my job when we went to India. Dr. Felt is our ablation expert, and I'm, it, so he would focus on a slightly different type of procedure. Dr. Pretorius is a cardiothoracic surgeon, so yet again a different area of expertise that we would all bring in. And then Dr. Srivatsa is, is, like Dr. Felt, mainly ablations. And Dr. Srivatsa is, is the, the doctor who spent a year at this hospital a couple of years ago, so she, she was her point of contact. None of us had gone on any similar type of mission ever before or, or worked in under these type of circumstances. We were very excited to go, excited and then, you know, of course you wonder, what have I just gotten myself into? Because you really have absolutely no idea what this will be like. But yes, absolutely excited before and after. <laughs> We arrived at the airport in Bangalore at 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, right away you can tell you are not in San Diego anymore. There were still people everywhere at 2 o'clock in the morning and the traffic was, even at that time, unbelievable. So with uh, feeling slightly like we were putting our lives on the line, we actually made it to the hotel um, and uh, they got to rest up a little bit and then it was off to work the, the, the next day at the hospital. Um, we came to the, the hospital is a beautiful hospital building and um, I was so impressed just walking into to this, this really exquisite looking entrance hall and I was asking about that and, and the, the people greeting us said, well, it's very important that uh, the poor patients who come to us will walk into a hospital and feel like we're, we are going to treat them right. And I thought that that was such a good point. And it made me feel really good just walking into to the hospital thinking that this is what this is about. The team was myself, uh, Dr. Pretorius, the cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Felt, who will, was doing the ablations, Dr. Srivatsa from UC Davis for ablations, and Dave Robertson, who is our um, EP lab technician. The first obstacle we had to get over was a very practical one. Um, they're much smaller than us in India, and the scrubs didn't fit. So we, we had to go look for scrubs that would fit. So once we were all in scrubs, then, then they brought us essentially straight into the labs and the operating rooms. Um, the, um, there was one cardiologist there who was really the, the guy who did everything. So he was our, our go-to physician. And he was, he was very nice to us, but clearly kind of checking us out a little bit. Wanted to know what we were all about. And, and I think certainly rightfully so, but it wasn't like he was going to immediately say, Dr. Green, <laughs> come do procedures here always. Um, the staff were surprisingly uh, easy going with the flow kind of thing. Suddenly I'm there in the lab doing procedures and and it felt very quickly like we could work together. For me, for my first day, um, I was actually surprised how, how much they would immediately let me do. They had um, identified the patients already, so by the time I, I walked into the lab, they introduced me to the first little um, seven-year-old girl who needed a pacemaker. I went down and I said hi to her parents. 
as much as we could talk to each other. And, and then we went to work and put the pacemaker in. It was smooth interactions and, um, you know, you got to learn a little bit about um, the slightly different setup, the slightly different tools that you have. But once you're working, once you're doing a procedure that you're used to do, it's, I, I felt it was actually interesting to see how, how different the country can be and how different the people can be and how different the cultures can be and how completely at home you can feel in an EP lab doing something you, you love to do. We were there for five days um, actively working in the hospital and they had identified patients for us before we started working. So the patients were more or less kind of lined up for us to, to do the procedures on. But it, wasn't, it didn't always work out perfectly. So really every morning we would look at the, the charts and the patients and see who had made it into the hospital to get the procedure done because they had all been pre-screened before we came. And sometimes we, we had to make decisions on, well, we, we only have three defibrillators. Who are the three patients who are going to get these three devices? So that, that played a role in, in the decision making every morning. This patient is going to get this done. So then we would identify the patients. The patients would be brought up to the lab. I would typically do about three or four pacemakers a day on the, on the first four days we were there. The fifth day we, we had an educational seminar uh, rather than doing procedures. The way they get patients to this hospital I think is by word of mouth that, that spreads really all over the country. So it, when you come to the hospital there are these big gates and the patients and families they line up outside the gates every morning. They open up the gates and the families with, with the kids, they come in and they go to the clinics and, and there are doctors there looking to see who can we help. The patients are identified that what we think we can help them were the ones that we would then get a chance to talk to. But, you know, unfortunately, there are so many patients and so many poor patients and so many who needs so much done that, that on one hand you're so happy and grateful that you're there to be able to help them and on the other hand you say oh, we need so much more and there were children there that we knew had come in too late that, that had they been able to get care earlier they would survive. There was one little boy I, I remember very well. There was one little boy there that I remember very well. He came in with his mom and dad and, and he, most of the kids were happy and running around and, and, and you know looking looking pretty pretty healthy after all. But but he did not. And one look at at him, you you knew that this was this was a heart problem that had gone too long. And in fact, it had. He he never came to the point where he was going to be operated on. And you know that those kind of things just breaks your heart because you know that that there are resources and and we are the resource and we can come and we can help and um, I think we did a little bit of that but there's so much more to do. We still see some of these patients in in a population in the US that may not have the same access to care as as everybody else. We would go to the ward where all the kids were with their parents waiting to, to have a date set up or time set up for their pacemaker or their ablation or their surgery. And it was really, really great to go around and meet, meet the kids, meet the parents, try and talk to them a little bit. And for the most part, these were kids that were smiling at you and, and happy and, and looked relatively healthy after all. Um, but there was one boy that I, I do remember very well. He, it was his, I think his name was Harish. Um, hard to know how old he was, seven or eight, but he, he looked younger and he just did not look healthy. And you start looking him over a little bit more. You knew that he had a heart problem that had just gone on for too long. And at this point, there was really not that much that, that we could do for him. Harish has, um, very poor quality of life and he has very little life left. I think that the mission was very much a success. Um, you know, you, you, as, as this being the first time you do something, 
you don't quite know what to expect. And, and um, what you would like to get out of a first time is, is really to establish a relationship, to feel that we have we have gotten to know the hospital, we have gotten to know the doctors, we have gotten to know the staff, and we helped. We, we, we did 35 cases, so we helped 35 patients during the, the five days we were there, and I think for those 35 patients, we really made a difference. And we can come back again, and the next time we can come back, we can maybe do even more, and it's going to be even easier because we have Establish this this, this uh, relationship and a, a sense of trust with everyone. So if you um, come back and you this becomes a mission that we can do every year, then I obviously the, the, the benefits are that the doctors in Bangalore at the hospital they know that we are going to have a certain amount of expertise at a certain time period. Let's really make sure that we have screened patients so that the boy like Harish can come in and and maybe we can you know help a few more on a personal and professional level one of the things that that I, I thought was very important was the fact that you you don't just want to do procedures oh, as as much as we love to do that you'd also like to bring in a component of of teaching and education so that when you leave the people who are there can can to some extent continue to do what you do and um, I, I had a young cardiology trainee with me every day for every procedure and and, and that was I think a tremendous experience for me and, and I think for them. Um, particularly I have to say there was one woman, young woman doctor and she was the only woman cardiologist at this hospital and in, in, in several of the other teaching institutions and, and she loved following me around <laughs> and she, she really, she didn't want me to leave and when I left she said, Dr. Green, you, you have really empowered me and I think those are important things also. There, we were very busy, you know, we were doing case after case after case but something that I quickly realized was very important is you have to break a little bit and have a cup of Indian tea and it's really good and then you sit down and you talk and just take a little bit of a break in action and it was a great way to get to know the doctors and and the staff but um, a little tradition that I almost like to take home with me. <laughs> we have been in contact with with actually s several of the doctors and and the staff at the hospital after that so I know that we're trying to establish maybe a, like a satellite type of educational program so that they could participate from their end in our EP conferences here um, to carry on this, this whole educational aspects of, of what we do. Um, I've been emailing the young woman doctor to see if maybe I can help her come to some meetings um, in, in the US. Um, and um, the, um, we've been in contact with a cardiothoracic surgeon there who is in fact uh, very interested in in coming to UCSD on a sabbatical. So lots of good contacts are, are being formed. When I was, what I was doing, I was there, was putting pacemakers and defibrillators in. And we had, um, with a kind donation, were able to bring pacemakers and some defibrillators there. So I knew we would be able to put them in. But I don't think I quite realized the incredible need for this. And I did find it hard to say we only have three defibrillators. Who are the three patients going to be who are going to get this potentially life-saving therapy? I wasn't quite ready for that. We were very lucky to have generous sponsoring of devices. So Medtronic donated uh, all the pacemakers and all the pacemaker leads. And Biotronic donated the uh, defibrillators with leads. I think we would all really, really enjoy going back. Um, we put a lot of hard work into the first trip. Going back again would certainly be easier because the groundwork has been laid from so many standpoints. And I feel like we could walk in and get to work right away and, and be really productive. 
but you know we couldn't do this without SALA and, and Children's Lifeline and, and the work that SALA and Children's Lifeline do to make these missions possible, I, I can't thank him and the Foundation enough. You leave with a little bit of mixed emotions. Um, you feel like you've done something good, but you also realize that there's so much more work to be done. Um, so you right, right away you feel like, I could do more, I'd like to come back, I'd like to do more. Um, you feel just, you, you leave, right, as you're really getting to know the people, and, and that's a little sad and frustrating too. On the other hand, I was really looking forward to not eating Indian food again. <laughs> Now they brought us food every day, so, so the lunches were served and um, it was always some sort of rice and some sort of stew. I was never quite sure what we were eating, but I was uh, quite sure that after one week of it, I, I would really like just some Italian, Italian pasta or something and I would like to have a really cold Diet Coke. The mission um was something that one of my former fellows, Dr. Shavatsa, had uh, been involved with as far as talking with and working with a lot of the doctors there. So she and my partner, Dr. Green, um, had communicated about the possibility of us going to India and they decided to include me, thankfully. But uh, I believe this really originated from Uma Shravatsa, who was one of the uh, Indian MDs, in fact, who's worked there in the past and, and knows this uh, hospital well. Now, I've never been on a previous medical mission before and I hadn't been to India either so I went there with a, a little bit of anxiety and trepidation not being sure what to expect but uh, found it quite uh, enlightening and valuable experience and we did a little tourist uh, attractions after the, the uh, mission as well which was quite interesting. You know really they made it so comfortable for us there um, that I didn't really feel there were any significant obstacles frankly. Um, one might consider just getting the travel plans uh, arranged being an obstacle and the, the passports and the visas. Some of those issues were technical obstacles, but my assistant helped a lot with that and Dr. Green and Dr. Shravats had a lot of experience with that as well. So for, for me personally, it wasn't a, a difficult problem to arrange. And then uh, uh, going to Los Angeles to fly to, uh, to um, Frankfurt uh, and then on to, to Bangalore was uh, actually a very good experience. The airlines was good. So all in all, I had a very enjoyable trip and really didn't find it difficult to make the arrangements at all. Well, on a mission like this, a medical mission, there's a lot of uh, technology that uh, one could bring from the United States to a poorer country, let's say, but we were surprised to find that as far as electrophysiology and ablations go, they had state-of-the-art equipment. We did have to arrange for uh, providing some supplies, some of the catheters we use, some of the pacemakers or defibrillators, and those had to be shipped through customs. So that was a, a bit of an obstacle. And in fact, uh, some of that material and equipment got there late, so we used some of their products and they replaced that later. But uh, that would be a consideration, I think, that you need to work well ahead of time and plan this sort of thing out in order to make sure that all the equipment you want to bring is there, because you don't just carry it on a plane, you have to ship it there. It goes through customs and, and then is delivered to the hospital. We found though that from the ablation electrophysiology standpoint, the equipment they had there was really state of the art. Uh, the cath lab equipment was excellent and the operating room equipment was excellent. The types of things that we would bring though would be the actual devices that we implant, maybe some of the very specific catheters, the types that we might use that they might not have there in stock. And, uh, we did find a number of interesting things about how a system like that runs, a charity hospital. They do re-sterilize and reuse a lot of products, so some of these products were not in the newest condition, but they were functional and they worked okay for us. Well, I think that one of the interesting things about India in particular is it's a massive population and there are just many, many, many children with medical problems that probably don't get adequate treatment just because of the sheer volume and the available resources that are there. The physicians there did an excellent job trying to work very hard to accommodate all their patients, but one thing I noticed was that we would treat a large number of patients one day and already there was a large number of patients waiting in the wings to be treated the next day. And I think that in a large country like that, there, there's no end to the, the patient population that, with problems. And certainly in, some, in the case of some individuals, because of those delays in getting to therapy, the final treatment might be too late and it's not going to help save them. So if you have more people there to help, you would expedite that. But one of the things that I found was that 
I went there uh, without really any clear-cut expectations because I wasn't sure what to expect. And I found that while I was there, I obviously had an impact on the lives of some of those children. And we brought some te techniques and expertise, I think, that even those doctors who had done a lot of work in this area still didn't have. We have some advanced techniques that we could offer for some of their specific patients. Other of our techniques were actually quite similar to things that they were already doing. So I don't believe I had a pretense that I was going to go down there, and certainly after I was there, that I was going to help a large portion of the population because it is a huge population. But one of the things that I did take away, and I discussed that with the doctors there, in fact, was that having gone there, at least for us, we could build a relationship that could go forward. And for example, one of the doctors there and I talk, talked about having ongoing uh, video linked conferences between here and there, either case uh, uh, cases that we'd perform or actual conferences where we could continue to educate and update their, their faculty on the newer technique, techniques. So I think that's something that uh, is a very important aspect of this type of a mission. You do help those people right then and there when you're there, but you can't be there every day of the year after that, but we can go back and uh, work with them a lot, even if we use remote telemedicine conferencing these days to improve their, their skills and, and treatments. Well, I think the mission was a success for a variety of reasons, as I had explained, both from treating and taking care of certain individuals, which we, we clearly helped, but there are others that are waiting in the wings that after we left, hopefully they had learned from us how to better treat those patients, and hopefully we can work with them in the future to continue to update them with the telemedicine type approach to things. So I think it was a resounding success. I think we learned a lot. Hopefully they learned some, and I think that we clearly helped those individuals that were there in the hospital at that time. Um, as an example, an anecdote, one of the patients was undergoing a procedure, an ablation procedure, and while the doctor there is quite experienced in, in performing this procedure, um, they were having difficulties achieving the end result, and I helped them with that, and uh, I'm not entirely sure if they would have succeeded without my help there at that time. So I think we contributed certainly uh, in some individual cases our expertise that, that uh, might not have been accomplished if we hadn't been there. And then I think also we, we can continue to, to do that with the future, either by going back periodically, uh, which I think would be important, but that's only once or twice a year maybe, and to do the teleconferencing, we could do that even once a week, for example. I think that it would be useful to continue these missions possibly even several times a year because the more presence we have there, uh, showing them the advanced techniques and things we're learning, uh, the better off I think they, their physicians and patients will be because this is a rapidly evolving field. And sometimes um, it's uh, acceptable and helpful to lecture and teach people verbally, but it's also very useful to do it personally while you're standing there with those physicians to show them the nuances of how to do the procedure. Uh, something that often can't be conveyed just by a lecture or a discussion. So I think that it would be valuable to have us go back and do further missions um, one or two times a year or even more. With respect to taking care of patients, there were certain uh, individuals that we met at that hospital, young children, believe it or not, who had had a lot of uh, difficulties, had surgery before, and had a tremendous attitude, and they were there to be helped, and we seemed to have a nice rapport with them, and they were very grateful, and I just found the Indian people to be very thankful generally, very accommodating, and I felt very comfortable there. Um, so from the standpoint of working in the hospital, uh, I thought it was a great environment, and uh, uh, we enjoyed that immensely. Um, there were also some other times when um, I found, for example, our guides to be particularly useful to really help explain to us the, the history and the bit of the culture of the country, and, and uh, it's something that we wouldn't have otherwise necessarily been exposed to if we hadn't talked to those individuals directly. And then, of course, there was an occasion where we have some great food there, too. The Indian food is very good. I enjoyed it. We have Indian food in the United States, and some of my fellows, in fact, are Indian, and they took me to the greatest local restaurant, but it still didn't quite uh, compare to what we had in the, in the real cuisine there locally. I felt uh, very comfortable there. Um, I didn't feel like I had left anything at home or forgotten anything. I had a tremendous amount of advice from Indian colleagues here on what to expect, uh, and, though, and so consequently I felt very comfortable. I think the one thing that did surprise me was just the enormity of the population and the crowdedness of the city, particularly with respect to the, the vehicles in the streets. I did notice as we were traveling through the streets that 
the vehicles constantly honking at you, everyone from everywhere, and it seemed like just chaos, and yet they managed to make uh, things work quite smoothly. Um, so that was interesting, and after about a week, I just tended to ignore all that and would have discussions with the driver and the likes, and it seemed normal, but that was a bit unusual and unexpected. This went very fast. Uh, it could, certainly could have been two weeks uh, or longer, and uh, we could have done a lot more. But we did a lot of cases in that short period. It was just then that I realized that um, uh, there, there are so many more people that we could have helped and taken care of that uh, we, we needed more time there, definitely. Have I ever been on uh, a humanitarian trip before? Um, well, the answer is no. Um, this was the first time. Um, always uh, have been looking forward to opportunities like this and uh, when this came along I was uh, quite excited and uh, happy to go with the group. Expectations uh, varied. Um, there was times where uh, I wasn't uh, sure what we were going to do, what uh, opportunities uh, would lie ahead. Um, knowing it's uh, in India and that it's an emerging market uh, you realize that uh, there might be a big variation in, uh, in health care and I wasn't sure exactly uh, what level of care um, we were going to uh, be contributing at and, uh, and therefore uh, there was a, a lot of uncertainty um, heading over there. It's also a, a first time for uh, this group uh, heading out to that specific hospital. So uh, yeah, it was, um, it was uncharted and unknown territory. When we arrived, it was uh, in the middle of the night, actually the early morning hours, and uh, we uh, we took a car um, ride from uh, the airport uh, to the hotel that we stayed in. Uh, it was dark and uh, was a pretty harrowing drive, as far as I'm concerned, coming from uh, California with uh, highways where everything's going smoothly. Here we had people, animals, buses, bicycles. Uh, overloaded uh, vehicles all on the road and uh, we were going at uh, pretty fast uh, speed uh, navigating uh, through all of that so uh, it was a shock and then um, the hotel when we arrived there uh, was very comfortable and everything was uh, uh, felt a little bit uh, more familiar and then uh, also the first time we went to the hospital was uh, just going through the traffic, uh, the, uh, the masses of people um, on the roads, uh, making their way to work, to school, to their activities uh, was, was really uh, almost overwhelming in the beginning. Um, and uh, at the hospital itself, it was uh, just driving up to the hospital. This is a surprisingly beautiful uh, building. Um, really majestic, uh, seemed uh, very well controlled. We went through the gates and uh, it was as if there was a, a calm within the grounds and uh, people uh, seemed to be organized, knew where they were going and where to go. Um, and then uh, we were very uh, uh, well received. Um, clearly the culture was a, a little different. Uh, at places you take your shoes off and uh, just the different ways that people would greet and uh, the way they would show respect. Um, was uh, was different to uh, our culture and uh, um, something to get used to, but uh, they were overall uh, extremely friendly and inviting, um, accommodated us, uh, introduced us to all the uh, various people at first and then uh, took us to the areas where we were going to work and uh, I was surprised to uh, see how uh, big the unit was, how many cases they did, um, uh, how many surgeons there were, uh, that was all, they were all working, um, and uh, the complexity of the cases that they uh, would uh, take on as well. That uh, emotion changed uh, as, uh, as the week went by from uh, um, what are we doing here, uh, how can we help these people to uh, uh, feeling, yes, we, we are, we are contributing and we are uh, making a difference uh, um, to the people, the, the staff, as well as the, uh, the population there. Um, the expertise, the knowledge, uh, what I found was uh, mostly the, uh, the staff uh, are capable, they, uh, they're fairly well uh, trained, um, physicians, surgeons, um, but they, uh, they were wanting to uh, bounce uh, the complex cases off me and see how I would think about it. Uh, they were hungry for uh, 
um, just for information and for uh, just seeing how uh, we would be doing cases uh, here. Um, and uh, by the end of the week, I felt, uh, yes, this was uh, really good. Uh, I was contributing and uh, I most probably made uh, friends um, that uh, will be long-lasting uh, friendships um, and uh, that we, uh, we really affected uh, um, healthcare for many people, not uh, directly by my own hands, but uh, with the interaction and the encouragement uh, that I could give to the, uh, the surgeons there. Um, and uh, I think uh, many more people will benefit than just the uh, few cases that I personally could uh, operate on. I quickly realized that uh, the, uh, the health care uh, that they provide is different to uh, what we would provide. Um, it's, uh, it's free to the, to the population and uh, for that reason you often saw pathology that was extremely far, uh, far advanced and uh, um, already uh, progressed uh, far down um, the, the normal uh, natural history of the disease um, and uh, would have liked to be able to help these people earlier. Uh, young kids with uh, uh, atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect, a uh, hole in the heart uh, essentially that uh, present very late. They already have uh, some damage uh, to their uh, ventricle and if only you could uh, see those patients earlier and help them sooner, uh, you can uh, actually help them to uh, develop and thrive and uh, grow to their full expectation and not be stunted in their development and, uh, and then uh, allow them to have a, a full active life. So yeah, th there was definitely cases where uh, I was thinking if only we could uh, help this patient sooner, uh, the effect can be so much bigger. Definitely, uh, I would encourage uh, to, uh, to send more missions there, uh, establish the uh, relationship uh, um, because initially it's a bit of a, um, a building of relationships in, in, the, in the early phases and then uh, that can grow um, and uh, I definitely would support uh, yearly or bi-yearly uh, missions uh, to the same hospital with the same group. Um, I can clearly say there will be benefit to uh, many people. I think the biggest surprise was um, uh, to see how many young surgeons they, uh, they actually have and uh, how well trained uh, these uh, young surgeons are and how eager they were to, to learn more um, and uh, to advance their own careers and to contribute to, uh, to their own uh, population, to their own nation um, with, uh, with their expertise. And uh, so I think that was the biggest surprise. Uh, was um, the, the volume of uh, young hands to, uh, to do the work, to do the operation. They, they just need more training, more experience um, to be able to uh, make a bigger contribution. Happy to, uh, to be heading uh, back home to, uh, to my own loved ones, but uh, in another, another way, uh, a little bit of sadness because you, uh, you leave behind uh, good friends that you've made, uh, patients that uh, you uh, seen and uh, became a bit attached to uh, so uh, yeah that uh, it's always a uh, mixed emotions that you experience um, as you heading back home one of the the best moments <laughs> was uh, the the charge nurse in the uh, in the operating room um, preparing a, a very nice tea and uh, bringing this uh, special tea that she brewed for me with uh, and she prepared it that it makes a little bit of foam on top of the tea. It was uh, really very enjoyable. And uh, she quickly noticed that I uh, enjoyed this uh, very much and uh, I got uh, several cups of uh, this tea uh, in the course of a day. The charge nurse in the operating room um, brewed a, a very special tea uh, that she uh, uh, made it was really sweet and uh, had a little bit of foam that was uh, on top of it and uh, she would bring that to me in the operating room several times in the day. Uh, it was uh, definitely uh, not thrust in uh, the first day I uh, just observed and uh, um, they did a, a fairly complex operation and uh, that gave me the opportunity to see at what level do they function and uh, um, and uh, it was good just uh, finding my own feet and uh, getting oriented to the staff uh, who is who in the operating room 
and uh, that served me well for by the time that I got the opportunity to operate because uh, then I've seen what the normal way of function was and I could adapt and uh, basically just uh, blend into uh, their normal operations. Well, I definitely think the relationship building is, is always an ongoing process. But uh, at this point in time, I think uh, that uh, it will be that uh, if we return, when we return, would be uh, we will just uh, fall right in and start working. Um, the trust is there. They've seen me uh, function and operate and care for their patients. So uh, I'm sure they will uh, by this time be happy to let me um, care for the patients again. And uh, as far as the relationship building, it's uh, it's ongoing. Um, I'm. Uh, at the moment, uh, having conversations with uh, one of the surgeons who uh, would like to come and spend a sabbatical with us uh, here at UCSD to uh, get exposed um, to some of the uh, advanced techniques and uh, uh, operations that uh, we do, which he would like to take back uh, and perform on his patients back in India. I think Children's Lifeline is absolutely essential for, uh, for this mission. Uh, th this is what made it possible for us to, uh, to go. And um, it has a, a machinery that's in place to uh, send uh, medical missions like this um, and affect uh, many people. So uh, it was uh, really good to be part of this uh, uh, already well-established um, mission uh, organization. Um, and uh, I'm sure that in the future uh, I'd like to uh, be involved and uh, go on uh, f future uh, missions and um, see if I can contribute in any way. I've always liked Indian food, but uh, I was told once we got to India that most of the people that set up restaurants in the United States are from northern India. So uh, I was excited to try some southern Indian food. And uh, yeah, I was excited about that aspect of it because I've always liked like uh, tandoori chicken and naan is the best flatbread ever. And uh, so when I got there, uh, that was I wanted to go to a place with a lot of flatbread and they found one of those places and it was delicious. So I, everything I ate, I loved. Getting off the plane, I remember the smell uh, of kind of burning wood. Uh, and later on, once traffic got going, uh, the smell of exhaust got mixed with the smell of burning wood. The air over there wasn't the best. Uh, but uh, the people that I met, uh, you know, the people in the airport, uh, generally in any country I've ever been to, haven't been the friendliest. and. Once we got out of the airport, though, everybody I met there was just warm and uh, welcoming, and, and the Indian people are, are, are very, were very friendly to us. Culturally, yeah, I didn't really notice anything culturally uh, in terms of doing things differently, um, but it took a while to warm, to get the staff to warm up. Uh, they kind of went about their business and did their thing. Um, and we kind of did our thing. And I guess we were kind of checking each other out for a little bit. Uh, it wasn't like they were cold, but they were just going about their business and, and we were kind of going about ours. And then uh, they started to warm up gradually. And I think we started to warm up uh, gradually because we, we had a, a big day the first day there. We did a lot of cases. and. Um, the more we interacted, the more things seemed to click between us. There were some things that took getting used to because they're, uh, the way they do things over there is very different than the way we do things here. And they, uh, for example, their director of cardiovascular services would walk into the control room barefoot every day. And that just, that just blew me away. I can't imagine walking around a hospital barefoot, but for them, that's just how they did it. And, a lot of the staff wore flip-flops. And don't get me wrong, I love flip-flops, but I never, you know, you can't do that here in the United States. Um, and they, their challenge seems to be supplies and they reuse everything. And uh, we spent a little bit of time every case trying to get things that we were reusing to work again correctly. Uh, so that took a little bit of getting used to. But uh, even with all those types of delays, we still did twice as many cases or even some days three times as many cases as we would do in the United States. They're very efficient over there. They didn't have a dedicated EP uh, consultant. They call their, their uh, we call them attendings here in the United States, they call them consultants over there. 
their guy was a jack of all trades. He would do uh, devices, uh, you know, like pacemakers and defibrillators. He would do interventions, uh, opening up coronary arteries, and he would he would also do a little bit of EP. And we did some cases there that I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have been able to do with without us there. Dr. Feld, uh, you know, has got 25 years experience in EP and is just a is just a very bright, quick thinking, brilliant guy and. We did some cases that would have been, you know, challenging for anybody. But uh, if it weren't for us, I don't think they would have got them done over there. And switching over to pediatrics, uh, you know, being a parent, I, I'd never worked on anybody younger than about 13 years old, and uh, I think our first patient was six years old. And just thinking of my own, I've got a son who's seven, and thinking about you know what it must be like for for somebody that age to be on the table around you know not only you know medical professionals from India but foreigners who were standing around and speaking a different language and that that must have been something so that kind of tugged at my parental heartstrings that took a little bit of getting used to the only situations that I saw that were like that were not because of the patient's disease progression it was more because uh, the short supply of defibrillators, like we only had a handful of defibrillators that we could implant into people. And so they basically set up kind of a triage and uh, the defibrillators went to the younger patients. We, there, was a, there was a guy who was, I think, maybe around 50 or so that definitely would have gotten one here, but since they're so scarce over there, he didn't get one. So. Um, we, and I brought that up with our, one of our reps from one of the companies we work with, and he said, absolutely, you know, if we got involved, we could help the supply of that and definitely make an impact there. Um, and yeah, we were needed over there because, uh, you know, I think that we can, we can help the, the, their interventionalists because uh, we can show him how to do the, you know, maybe take a ne the next step in his, um, in his EP career. Uh, and help him to do some more difficult procedures because they've got a patient population over there where they get the same types of arrhythmias coming through. Um, we've already gone through most of the people that had Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome in the United States. We don't see many of them. There are a ton of them over there in India and it's a relatively simple procedure uh, and once they learn how to do it, they could make a big impact over there. I think we could show them that. There were a couple of uh, things that we do differently and they were doing fine what they were doing was was a good practice but we've s sort of developed uh, something that we think uh, is maybe a little bit uh, a better practice and i was explaining uh, those a couple of those things to the techs and they seemed very interested in learning and uh, um, i think a good tech uh, you know, good team, uh, everybody is kind of watching everybody else's back and I think that's part of being a good tech and I showed the techs a couple of things where they could uh, contribute to, um, to the practice by watching some things for the physician because the physician is just overloaded with information in an EP case. There are so many different things to look at and as a tech you want to take some of that load off the physician and we shared a couple things with uh, the techs that would allow them to do that. and. Uh, the next time, hopefully, we'll get to go back, and uh, I will. I will try to share some more things, and 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 I, we've kind of established, you know, we kind of know how they practice now, and we kind of know that if we go back, there are some things we probably do differently um, and better. And, and by that, I mean better. I think that it was a great mission, and I think we did a lot of good. But I think if if we are fortunate enough to go back, then then I think it'll be even more effective because we've kind of established relationships and uh, we know how they practice and they, they've got an idea on how we practice and I think we can share things and we can grow together. Because I think that healthcare in the United States could learn a lot from how they do things over in India because they, they are very efficient, much more efficient than we are. And I think that would help to, to drive down costs in the U.S. if we could sort of adopt some of the things they do for efficiency. And uh, I think that we can bring uh, some knowledge and, and being a teaching hospital here, you know, we're kind of out in front in, in EP a lot and we're working on a lot, of, uh, a lot of studies and we get very fresh information and we can, we can bring that back to them uh, if we're fortunate enough to be able to go back to, to Bangalore. It was on our first day and it was our third patient and uh, you know, most of the patients, the first two patients that we had, they were, they were scared kids. And, you know, I did the best to kind of uh, have, 
to be to be soothing to them. And uh, I don't know if it worked or not. But the third patient that came in, uh, you know, I smiled and I did the the uh, the Hindu Namaste uh, to the patient, and she smiled at me, and the look in her eyes was just uh, I will never forget it. She just seemed. I, I can't even describe the look, but it just, it almost, it, she probably calmed me down more than I calmed her down because I wasn't work, used to working with kids and, and being a parent, it was kind of, it took a little getting used to. And I, it was funny how she, she kind of, she kind of calm, calmed me down instead of me calming her down. But uh, we were, we were able to, uh, to correct her arrhythmia and uh, I was able to meet her and her father the next day and get a picture with the both of them. And, and her name was uh, Kushbu, which I was told means something like uh, smiling face or something like that in, in uh, the language over there. When there was somebody who, was, who needed a defibrillator who, you know, may not survive without one and couldn't get one, that, that was tough because we don't have that problem in the U.S. If people don't have the money to pay for something like that, then you know, the hospital steps in or the government steps in or the device company or all everybody steps in and makes sure that person gets a defibrillator, but it's not the same over there. And that's, uh, as a medical professional, not used to dealing with situations like that. That was, that was pretty tough. India's a big country and we didn't make a dent in, in the population, but we did impact some lives. And I think there are some people walking around in Bangalore today that feel better because we were there. And uh, I feel good about that. And I feel good about uh, the connection that, I, that uh, the Tex and I made over there. And I've been in contact with, with four people that I met over there uh, since I've been back. And uh, that's something I'll, I'll never forget. And you know, one of the things I liked about um, the, the hospital was that not only are they caring medical professionals, but to them, working at that hospital goes beyond just being a medical professional. It's uh, Sri Satsasai is, is, was their God on earth. And they feel that by working at that hospital, they are serving their God. The people that work at the hospital, it's, you know, they, they love being medical professionals, they love helping people, but it, there's a devotional component that, that we don't have it, you know, that we don't see very often, or I haven't seen in the United States. Uh, you know, I, I work at a teaching hospital, so I know there are religious hospitals in the United States, but they really seem to serve uh, Sri Satchasai through their work at the hospital. And in talking to them about uh, Sri Satchasai, you could really see how much he meant to them and how much he means to them. And it, that was really something that I'll, I'll, I'll take with me.